we, we call neoliberalism. It's interventionist, American interventionist. When there's a bad thing going, it's up to America to correct it and destroy Iraq and replace Libya, a, a, a dictator who was in our pocket, by the way. This sort of notion of American good. <laughs> What are the real motivations behind o Obama's war on, on Syria? Because we, we, we've, we've, we've read your article and we, we, we found that one of the major topics is that, that Obama goes on about is the, the existence of, of moderate forces. Are there moderate forces? The consensus is any moderate force that still exists as of a year or year or two years ago um, uh, has to make an accommodation either with El Nusra or, or, or uh, ISIS and we are still shipping weapons into to groups we think are moderate, the, what we used to call the FSA, the Free Syrian Army. It's certainly in the beginning there were legitimate grievances against Bashar Assad. He never, he never delivered on many promises. There was too much. He never delivered on more education. There were serious droughts. There were years of droughts and many of the farming communities were drying up and he hadn't done enough to ameliorate that. Corruption still was very high. His family members were still getting contracts to build things. There was all the usual crap that goes on with a despot, with a, uh, with a leader, a ruler. On the other hand, he had liberated a number of stuff. I started going to Syria quite often every year when, the, when, the war, when we began the war of, of, uh, against Iraq. And when I first went there, there was no internet, no, no news, and by 09, 010, you could go to a, a bank and get money. You could watch um, Western broadcasts. You could even watch a, a, a soap opera in which an unmarried woman had a child, a lover had a child. That was like, are you kidding? It was, uh, it was on, it was a Turkish show. On Monday nights, the whole city stopped, Damascus, to watch that show, because they'd never seen anything like that before. It wasn't permitted. So there'd been some changes, um, but there was serious opposition. His party ruled by force when they had to, and you couldn't criticize him openly. Uh, although he wasn't as bad as his father, you could, you know, it, things were better, but the things were still, in terms of the democracy, far from it. And so there's literature, what happened is, I think history will show that both, um, mostly Saudi Arabia, had been plotting for a long time to move against Bashar, and the Arab Spring gave him some free, freedom to do so. And very quickly, what began as an, a spontaneous operation was taken over by the more fanatic people who were definitely against him. And so, by oath, by 2013, we were still supporting groups that were considered moderate. I, I think right now you could argue that uh, what's really going on is that Russia and America and the Iranians, the Quds Force, and Hezbollah, it's, it's, it's in the field, and the Syrian army, they call SS, SAA, are now fighting a war together against a NATO ally, a country, the, Turkey, that's a NATO member of NATO. It's the most amazing situation. We're actually at war against Turkey because Turkey has been no question supporting ISIS and El Nusra and other groups for, for many years. And it's no, no, you know, the borders have been open. And so Ergoden, the president, is increasingly being cornered on this. And so there's, there's really, that's a, a major story. And nobody, tells the, nobody wants to put it that way in America. In America, you can't talk about doing anything with Russia. If you mention Putin, everybody goes, you know, my God, we, we have to hate Putin. If you remember, if you know your history, Stalin signed a pact with the Germans. And then he, uh, after a year, he reneged and fought the Germans. And so we were very happy to work with Stalin and help him do that. In the daily press, we still talk about Turkey as if somehow they're on our side in this war. They're not. They're in a panic about the Kurds. The Kurds are also part of the coalition with us. The Kurds have been a long-time opposition force, the PKK, and you also have the Kurds who um, uh, are, they're Syrian Kurds, many of them, who are fighting with us uh, against ISIS. And I, I think basically the reality is that in terms of, a, of, of Turkey's main supply line, the war is going very well, believe it or not, for the, because the Russians came in. For Syria, this is an all-out war, and this is, whatever I think of Bashar or not is in the point. Yes, Bashar is using barrel bombs in the war, and the civilians are being killed crazily. But I'll tell you a country that used barrel bombs for seven years in a war that did not impinge on American national security. It was called the United States of America and Vietnam. We use barrel bombs because they're cheaper. You can, 60 pounds full of uh, na napalm or an acid that can destroy vegetation. We were dropping it all over. And, I, and when we had a war that was a national security war for us, a war that we thought our, the, the world was at stake, let's see, we dropped two nuclear bombs 
in, in, in Japan. We also did mass bombing. If you remember Curtis LeMay, if I've read, or the, the bombing of Tokyo, and the American bombing of, from England of uh, Germany, Hamburg, and, and the Dresden, the Dresden bombing, fire bombing. I had a family member that was on that raid. And he, he described the shame after pulling away from the, he was with the 8th Air Force, a navigator. Uh, um, and he described the shame of seeing the city light up as he turned around. You know, they, they thought they were bombing a ball bearing plant, but they were really bombing a city and destroying a city. So you have that situation that it's an all out war for Syria. And America's position has been so strange. We're so, we, we hate Bashar so much, we can't look at the bigger picture, which is in the short run anyway, he's gonna have to stay. And there are about 82% of the population in Syria is under, under, under Bashar's control. And if you watch and see, there are elements of, even in, in Aleppo, there's two thirds of Aleppo where life goes on. There's many parts of Damascus, not the suburbs, where life goes on, including at nighttime, dancing and drinking. It's a very social society. And um, uh, life goes on. And we just don't know it in the West. We see everything in black and white. Considering the, mostly the, the chaos generated in, uh, in both Iraq and Libya, with this, with this ousting and actually killing. We, we call neoliberalism. It's interventionist, American interventionist. When there's a bad thing going, it's up to America to correct it and destroy Iraq and replace Libya, a, a, a dictator who was in our pocket, by the way. He was against Al-Qaeda uh, only because, we, you know, this sort of notion of American good. <laughs> Considering the outcome of, 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 of this conflict and, and the U.S. involvement, did, didn't the U.S. learn their lesson? Well, you have a woman running for president who was the architect of it, Hillary. Is she ever asked about it? Never, rarely because to do so would imply more knowledge than most people who see her on TV have. You know, de Tocqueville said something about America. You know, the famous French philosopher who wrote, what is it, in, it was 200 years ago. He spent time in America and he wrote and he said, well, here's the problem with America, he said. And this is why America is always going to be a war country, a country full of war lovers. Because in England and Europe, the military are run by royalty. And we have the, you know, the Dukes always have an army and Britain is very good, the Irish and, you know, the Scots, they all have the, when you get a, when you're a, no, no, a nobleman, you get an army. In America, the army comes from the people. So it's one of the places where you can be, go into the army and be the best killer and get promoted. And so what happens is the way to success is to be the toughest and the best. So the people who end up leading the armies in America will be people who need war because that's how they can stay on top, because there's no royalty. He said, it's a real disadvantage. He said, there'll be a war country. It's very interesting he said that. In regards to the sarin gas attacks in yes. Utah, tell us what happened there. Well, oh, the only thing I know, know, is that Obama was told by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, his name is Dempsey, and Dempsey back then, 30 years ago when he was a tank commander, would have a drink with the Russian commander in East Germany. He's now a ranking general in Russia, and Dempsey became a ranking general in America, and Sir Peter Wall was a ranking general in England, and the three all knew each other, and they all trusted each other. They were captains, and if we ever get to run the world, we'll, we'll do it better. They agreed on that. And so the Russians got sarin, a sample, and it did not match what we know was in this, in the, you have to remember, after 1991, when the wall went down, there was a long period of very relaxed time. The Russians and us worked together. We helped Russia get rid of some of the nuclear weapons in the Ukraine and elsewhere. And one of the things we shared was that Russia had worked very closely with Syria on its uh, chemical weapons because uh, it's very sophisticated. To, to Sarin is a gas that you can't keep as a gas. It's too toxic. You have to keep it as two different chemicals. And in order to use it, you have to meld it. And that process is, unless you know what you're doing, you can die in a minute. It, it produces a toxic gas, nerve gas. And so we knew that the agent that was used was made amateurly. It was not the agent that was in the, Sir, in the Syrian arsenal. Syrian arsenal has various different chemicals that can add toxicity, that can diminish the, uh, if you leave sarin alone, in two days it'll burn through any canister. So we had, the, the Syrians had some more sophisticated form of it. And they analyzed it. You have a facility called Porton Downs which is the leading chemical and biological facility for the West in the world. And America, that's our, that's your, for America, the Porton Down standard is the standard. And the Porton Down got some of this 
sarin from Russians concluded had nothing to do with the Syrian arsenal. That doesn't mean some rogue operation took place. It just means that what the president was saying, there was no factual basis for. We had no factual basis that the sarin used was his. That doesn't mean that somebody, he could have had some people do it on the side. I don't know that. It just wasn't his. And with that, he called it off. And the president then announced he did it because Russia's, uh, uh, the, the Syrians finally agreed to get rid of their chemical arsenal. The only problem with that story is, for 10 years, the, the Syrians have been trying to get rid of it. I had written articles about it in 03, about that useless arsenal they had. And why was it useless? Because it was under attack from the moment the rebels began. And the rebels, rebels the opposition in Idlib province near Aleppo, they actually seized an arsenal in, at the end of 2011, got access to it, access to it. Big problem for Russia. Russia was helping the Syrians defend it. There was a summit two months before the Syrian incident, and at the summit, Russia, Putin and Obama had an hour meeting, and the spokesman for the president on the record said they talked about getting rid of the arsenal. That had been on the table for a long time. We resisted it. We're not going to make it easy for them. What made it different? It was a billion point two dollars to get rid of the arsenal. It's very expensive. Who had the money? We did. We paid, I've been told by people who know in the UN, as much as a billion dollars of the fee to get rid of it. And so the answer is, he didn't tell the truth, period. I'm not saying that I know Bashar didn't do it, I'm not because he could have had a rogue element, I, but, uh, element in his unit, but I also know from studies done by MIT, the weapons, the two, the canisters that we covered, the two rockets were very primitive rockets that didn't fly more than a, a, a one or two kilometers at the most, a mile. They were fired within a mile, and um, far fewer people were killed. And they, they, everybody said 1,400 was, uh, look, one death is too many, but you had to be in direct contact. It was very primitive stuff. You had to walk through it to get killed. It was about a, not 100, 140 maybe. Uh, and so it was much less. That's all, the facts are out on that. So there, there's something called forbidding information. The last story I wrote was about the chairman of the Joint Chiefs two years ago deciding to work with Syria. He was working against the interests of the president, basically, because he thought it was so crazy what they were doing. And so all you have to do is call up the, the general and ask him. But the reason if you're at the New York Times now, you don't, because what if he says no comment? Oh my God, that's forbidden information. You can't have that story because it's supposed to, not supposed to work that way. There's a narrative. And the West, the press goes with the narrative. And so I have a different narrative, and that gets me a lot of enemies in the press corps, my colleagues. What about the legality of, of, this, of this U.S. intervention? It is illegal. It yeah, no, the only, per, the, only purpose is, the only people who are there are the, are the Russians legally. Is it he counterproductive as well? Well, no, the fact is, Syria is a sovereign country. He's a sovereign leader. He didn't invite us in. And in fact, he has a lot of problems with some of the things we do, and we still cheat. He's not going to stop us, because basically, you know, his game is, the long game is us to recognize and to stop worrying about the fact, you know, we have so many myths in the world. One of the myths is anything Iran does is terrible. I, I said in the speech that the election was terrific. Rouhani is a, got to read about Rouhani. Rouhani's, he's been talking about getting rid of the, uh, getting a deal on the nuclear weapons for, for eight years. Rouhani goes back to the Iran-Contra dispute. It's a very interesting guy. And we, of course, don't do any homework. So Rouhani's much, uh, very uh, progressive. The election was a terrific election in terms of the moderates. And my, my guess is, I, I keep on telling my friends, they said 15 years disagreement after the 15 years, they'll go back and build a bomb. I said the chances of a National Basketball Association franchise there are much higher. Mr. Marhurst, thank you very much. Goodbye. It was a pleasure. Thank See you. Thank you. So long. Bye. My mistake on the first round was that Everywhere, I tried telling the story myself. The second time, I let people tell their story and tried giving it a context and a frame. 